So wastewater surveillance is essentially the practice of um, monitoring diseases or chemicals or other materials through our sewage. So everybody, you know, contributes to a public sewer system. Um, we do what health what experts might call depositing data, right? We we go into our bathrooms and we deposit whatever we've got going on inside of us, and scientists can use that to track. Um, the disease or other health situations at a population level. So in New York City, if you wanted to know the COVID levels, say, of the city, you could either have every single person in the city go get a PCR test, or you could only do 14 tests from the city's 14 public sewer treatment plants, um, which is basically what our uh, city environmental and health departments have been doing since fairly early in the pandemic. Uh, so this is a map of the 14 wastewater treatment plants. This is another map from DEP showing the regions that they cover. Um, so you can find this online and you can look up which, which sewer shed your apartment feeds into, um, which is pretty cool. You can go and see exactly what data corresponds to your neighborhood or your part of the city. Um, and as I said, this is really helpful in the realm of health surveillance because you're essentially getting data from hundreds of thousands of people, in the case of New York City, up to a million people from just one sample. And that can be really helpful for tracking disease or tracking other things like opioid use, uh, pharmaceutical use on a really broad scale. So where to find this data? It's posted online at the New York City Open Data Portal. Um, and just to give kind of a basic example of what you can do with it, this is a chart from a story that I worked on that was published in December at Muckrock and Gothamist um, showing COVID levels right. in New York City. Yes, um, Gail's got a copy of it. So you can, you can see the COVID levels over time throughout the pandemic um, from fall 2020 when the New York City program started to become a bit more standardized um, going through fall of 2022 was when we, we had the data up here. Um, and then another place where you can find New York City's data is on a dashboard run by the New York State Health Department and some researchers at uh, public New York universities. Uh, it's led by a researcher uh, named Dave Larson, who's at Syracuse. And basically, you can zoom in to New York City, and you can click on individual sewer sheds and look at the COVID concentrations over time. Um, so this is just one example. I pulled out Newton's Creek, which is, um, I think it's here in Queens, although I might, it might be in Brooklyn. It's, it's one of the, the sewer sheds, yeah. And then finally, you can also find New York City's data on a CDC dashboard. Um, which has uh, wastewater data from across the country all incorporated into one place. The CDC dashboard is a little less specific in the information it gives you because the CDC's National Wastewater Surveillance System is essentially trying to standardize from hundreds and hundreds of wastewater testing programs around the country that are not necessarily doing things all in the same way, which is a challenge we can maybe talk about more later if folks are interested. But essentially, um, you can go on here and see New York City's data and compare it to many other wastewater testing programs across the US. And then we get to this question of, okay, we're collecting all of this great data. What do we do with it? Uh, this is something that health officials and uh, wastewater testing experts are still working to figure out. But you know, just some examples of ways this has been used in the last couple of years. Um, you can direct health resources to specific neighborhoods or specific facilities based on wastewater information. Uh, one example, New York City Health and Hospitals actually has their own wastewater testing program where they're testing specifically at, at the hospital sites. And they use that to direct, for example, oh, we see a bit more COVID at this one hospital. So we're going to make sure this emergency department is prepared for maybe a few more cases in the next week or two. Um, because wastewater can preempt the hospitalization numbers. Um, you can also use wastewater data to inform public health messaging. So for example, <laughs> sorry, for example, a public health department might say, 
oh, we're seeing more of a COVID uptick or some other kind of disease uptick in a particular neighborhood. So we're going to, maybe we'll send out some uh, testing vans <coughs> or we'll put up some advertising and subway stations in that neighborhood, something like that, and make sure that folks are aware. Um, you could also use wastewater information to you know, track concerning outbreaks. So for example, last year we had a polio outbreak in the New York City uh, area. And so the health officials started tracking polio in our wastewater in addition to COVID. And they were able to use that to see, you know, what, what parts of the city are seeing more polio. Um, and then finally, you can use wastewater to start identifying and tracking new diseases as they become concerning. Uh, we've seen this happen with new COVID variants, <clears throat> where often new variants show up in wastewater before they show up in clinical testing, which is, I think, something Professor Jenner might talk about more. And you can use it to identify new pathogens as well. So if we have a novel outbreak of something, um, it might show up in the wastewater because, as I was saying before, um, testing hundreds of thousands of people with one sample is much more efficient <coughs> than testing all those people individually. So, um, Councilmember Brewer, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the evolution of New York City's program, why we started doing this earlier in the pandemic, you know, how it's changed over the last couple of years. I would be glad to. And I have to say, how many people have been to a waste water treatment plant? Oh my goodness. Okay. Nice. People. Have you been? Not yet. I really want to. It's, they're really phenomenal. I guess what, when I was in college a hundred years ago, <laughs> I did a paper, my thesis on this goddamn waste water treatment plant. I had forgotten. I ran into um, Professor Ken Jackson. I don't know if you know him. He is a historian in New York. And when I was borough president, he was at the New York Historical Society. He was the interim president. And one day he called me and said, you know what I found in the basement? I found your fucking paper, border <laughs> treat. I'm not making this up. I said, Professor Jackson, you are out of your mind. He had taught at Columbia for 40 years. How many damn papers did he have in that basement? I don't know. So anyway, this is a, um, so I do think that the wastewater treatment issue, if not just mentioning, uh, I mean, the plants in general are very interesting. And yeah. DEP will do tours, so you should make an opportunity to do that. And second, um, my understanding is just as, as a little bit off the topic, but if Rikers Island closes, which I hope it does, then we could close three of the older plants and put a new one on Rikers Island. And that would hopefully incorporate some of the things that you are talking about yeah. that would be much more modern. So it's a really important topic. Um, what happened for me was... I don't know why, I've always been interested in this topic. So as borough president, uh, I was there for eight years. Um, we had a solid waste advisory board, which we reconstituted. And so that group of 50 individuals was interested in the topic, had some sort of low-level hearings on the topic of wastewater treatment, and just generally the plants themselves. So that was one place where this topic came in. But the second is my hero, Pam Millardo. Um, she was a, I think, a deputy commissioner. I always thought she was even more important. She could have run the whole city. Um, but she was in charge. Uh, uh, she's very outspoken. She's actually in Seattle, moved back to Seattle fairly recently. But in New York today for the Water uh, Conference of the United Nations, whatever that conference is about, I have no idea. But she's there for that. And so um, she, we, we became friends, and she invited me to go to the plants. I had so much fun going to all the different plants. I think it went to about three of them. And um, she was the one that 20, 19, 2020 who pushed. It was not easy because, to be honest with you, no matter who was commissioner, de Blasio, or then in came Adams, nobody could understand what this topic was and why we would be so interested. I don't even think that makes no sense, but believe me. She had staff lined up. She couldn't get them to be hired, and she didn't have a lab. Everything was going to Stanford in California and coming back. Does that make any sense? No. So it was, she was shipping everything to California to get tested, get no lab. So I was like a dog with a bone at the Office of Management and Budget. I just stayed on them until she got the funding for the staff and the funding for the lab. That was my small role in trying to get this thing uh, off the ground. Um, but she did point out, of your article and she told me that if it wasn't for the 
pandemic, she probably would have taken another five years because at least people could understand there was a crisis and her work could help solve some of the crisis. So that's what, what, what the deal was in terms of the beginning of this effort. And it was her initiative. I mean, I, I never forget that. We wrote letters um, to the uh, city and the state at that time, I think December 2021. It was interesting to me, 2022, you know, the uh, DEP figured out that I had become borrow the, back to the city council so they could find me. So they wrote a response, which was nice, a letter from BP response to the city council. But basically, I believe, and I know this, I don't think there's anybody here from DEP or from the health department. My understanding is they wouldn't come. Other agencies are at the conference, but my understanding is DEP didn't want to come. Okay. The issue is, I think they're nervous because if we become like Boston or Seattle, which have much more open data, then people might panic at the raw data. And then they will think that there's something happening in the area. I can't stand this. I am the author of the open data bill. I am amidst transparency about government. So I believe so strongly in open data and transparency in data. So this makes me upset, but we have to work on it. So, um, my understanding, I'm sure that's the reason that DEP is not there. And the letter basically responded with saying, you know, we're worried about the fact that we don't know if the data is accurate, it could be erratic, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, other cities have managed to do this. So I don't know why we are so behind it. My also, my understanding, um, you know, they don't, a letter also said one to avoid public confusion. Well, you're mostly confused if you don't have data. That's when you get confused. So. I don't know that there's much change, even with a new uh, commissioner. So we need to work on this. There's no question. Also, my understanding, and there are others who might know, is that the EP to collect this data, you're not going to like this, is still using clipboards. And that's a problem because it's really hard to take data from the clipboard to actual dashboards. And, you know, you know better than I, but that's, that's a problem. So there's just a lot of steps that have to be taken to get to the point that we want to be at. Intro 633, which is um, a co-sponsor of it, it's uh, Keith Powers, who's the prime sponsor. This was a follow-up to a bill that passed in 2021, 2021, 2021. went into effect in 2021. But the whole goal of all of this legislation, um, this the current legislation pending, would talk about testing twice a week, publish results every week on a, on a website that is understandable to the public, annual reporting at the end of August, um, collect results, collect the data, test them, and give us the cost of the testing and show how effective it is. That would be the kind of uh, scenario that anyone would want if you're doing good data. Uh, now, of course, we don't know, and there are others here know better than I, God forbid there's another health crisis in the city of New York. We don't know what it's going to be. People talk about it's going to happen. I don't know. I mean, that's why you have to be prepared. You can't wait for you know, manana, manana, to see if this is going to be something that we're going to need. Well, of course, we're going to need it. Um, but I have to say, for some reason, this is one of these issues that if there's no advocacy, then it doesn't happen. And it didn't happen at the beginning, and I think we have to keep working on the same issue. Um, this notion that, you know, um, you know, Corona or the Upper West Side or whatever is going to be nervous if the data shows that there's an outbreak somewhere, well, that's why you have the data, because then you address it and then you figure out what to do. I didn't know that health and hospitals was doing that. That's a, that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. I had no idea that Dr. Katz is often very forward thinking. So, I, I mean, I don't have a, a lot more to add, except to say that this conference today and this workshop today is more important than you might think. And I hope that everybody will do what they can to make sure that this issue gets on a much higher level. I'll certainly do do what I can. But um, there's just a lot of other data sets that are available. And for whatever reason, this is one that the city has chosen not to make publicly accessible in a way that people can understand. Yet yeah, they're just nervous about the raw data and they think that it's going to panic people. But to me, that's the opposite effect. Sunshine is the best uh, yeah. way to deal with uh, keeping people safe. So thank you. I'll add later if you want, but that's the beginning um, and it's raw as terms. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Just to say a little bit more about that. So the New York City Environmental and Health Departments do post the data publicly on the open data portal. 
as I said. Um, they publish it once a month, and it's got a bit of a lag, so you're not necessarily looking at real-time data, you're looking at data from a few weeks ago. Although it can still be really helpful to compare, and um, one thing that I've done is comparing it to cases, so you can see how in the last year or so in particular, the wastewater numbers uh, tend to be higher than the case numbers because we're not doing as much clinical testing for COVID in New York City as we were a couple of years ago, um, which obviously makes sense given the point we're at in the pandemic. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you can find the data on the New York State dashboard and the CDC dashboard. Um, but again, there are some lags there. Often the data are more than a week or two weeks old. So it's not super helpful for seeing real-time updates. And of course, if you're thinking about, you know, New Yorkers using this and responding to it, it would be really helpful to have our own city dashboard as many other places, like Boston is one example. Many other places do have their own dashboards that are specific and responsive to their community needs. So I think that is the thing that would be helpful in New York, as Council Member Brewer is saying, um, to have a specific city dashboard that our agencies and community groups and anybody else who is you know, responding to health threats can use to inform their decision making. Um, yeah. So I would like to turn it over to Professor Chandra now to talk more about the Columbia University program, which is another great example of this. Yeah. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Council Alberto Brewer. First of all, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, 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 also, always good to learn about what is happening, what should be happening as well. So I have my research group is based in the School of Engineering at Columbia University. You have the Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, this is all we do. We essentially open up the microbial black boxes inside wastewater treatment plants. And so this is what we've always done. This is all we've done. And so around January of 2020, yes, uh, we began to hear about some reports. But there are going to be more signatures in the, the sewage streams and the wastewater streams. So we did two things. We were already sequencing in the U.S. and outside the U.S. massive amounts of samples. So we started to take a look. We just changed the lens that we used. Instead of just looking at bacteria or other pathogens, we started to look for viruses. And the second thing we did was that we ordered a lot of extraction and supplies to extraction kits and supplies to process more samples. So that's something we started doing. And then we've been tracking, yes, SARS-CoV-2 and various a few different treatment systems, communities. So one of our uh, target communities is actually across the Hudson River, uh, Burton County, where we've been looking at two plants since May 12th, 2020, and that's going on even now. The monitoring at Columbia was a small pilot in the summer of 2020, but then since fall 2020, it's been right off as well. We've also looked at Provincetown, Massachusetts. We did that for a few months, and then been involved also with one of the state departments of correction, where we look at, again, a fair number of since and their prison populations as well. So I just wanted to perhaps very quickly respond to some of the comments and maybe we can open this up later on. Yeah, well. for sure. And indeed. And so what we get from looking at signatures or other indicators and in sewage streams and human waste streets is the equivalent of testing everyone every day. That's essentially what we are getting. Of course, what we are not getting is an individual fingerprint, but we do get the community impact as well. So that's really what the power of, what the capability of this technique is. Okay. And so what we have been doing, at, at, in, in addition to tracking SARS-CoV-2, as was mentioned, we've also tracked other uh, targets in a targeted fashion. So what everyone does when we look at SARS-CoV-2 is we go after SARS-CoV. We have a target to go after, and we go after SARS-CoV. And we've looked at, in response to what the needs have been, we've looked at monkeypox, influenza, A and B, polio, and RSD as well. And of course, we can keep adding to the targets one by one as the beat arises or as concerns arise. On the other hand, we can also, instead of responding individually one, by one after another in response to something that could be real or otherwise, what we could perhaps also do, and this goes to what we could potentially consider in terms of a continued effort, a sustained effort, is not just run after individual targets, after the fact. On the other hand, what we could potentially do is take a non-targeted approach where we are able to ask and answer questions, including who else is there, what, it's not just a who else is there, it's a what else can they do, because it's ultimately we can label individual pathogens and all of that is fine, but it's ultimately what the human health impact is. Even with SARS-CoV-2, we have so many different variants. We, of course, identify the different variants over time and 
this is a plot of, of the variance over time in different samples. In New York City, one of the wastewater clean plants, this is Columbia, this is the liquid phase sewage stream in Burger County. One of the plants are busy in the solids phase. So we track not just the liquid sewage, but also the solids, because some viruses get partitioned into the solids as well. So that track gives us some more information. But the color coding here is essentially just a list of, uh, just a list of variants. So not, nothing uh, signed, we've all seen this. But here, what we are, and I'm sorry about the text here, but we can have more of a discussion. What is actually on the table? It's not just the identity of these variants and that we have so many variants. It's actually what makes a variant a variant. What makes an Omicron an Omicron? What can Omicron strain X, Y, Z? What can they actually do? And therefore, what potentially could our responses involve? That, I think, is, at the end of the day, that is what is important. More than the who, it's what can they do and under what conditions they can do something. Okay. And so then this is something that is of high interest to us, especially when we stop running after when start chasing something after the fact, and we take a step back. So then the techniques involved are not just, for instance, it's not TQPCR, which is a targeted technique. If you have a question, you'll get the answer to that question alone. If you take a step back and perform, let's say, sequencing, with a SARS-CoV-2 filter, that's how we get our variants. But then if we take that filter out, we can get a lot more as well. And that I think it could be your interest and in partners as well. And thank you also for, I think it was pointed out that in some cases, variants can be detected a bit in advance. It depends uh, what the trend is. And that's what I'm showing here as well. And so this is not the most recent data. The most recent data we have is from February. And right now there are no surprises. There's nothing really, really new that has come up. Good. That's a good thing, actually. But anyway, so I'm also describing when we started to observe which variant of Omicron, and some of these dates actually precede the detection in human impact, human infected patient samples as well, and that could be used. One really interesting thing here is that one of the last vaccines was targeted not towards some of the most recent variants, and so that fortuitously was able to work pretty well. Work against the yes, indeed. Yeah, but that just happened, so we should be prepared, but perhaps a bit better as well. And then I wanted to also share. This is all pre-COVID, and so. This is one of our projects where we're looking at large populations in the northern part of India, eastern part of India. We were targeting fecal sludge treatment plants and sewage treatment plants, and there we were looking at, at there's no SARS CoV 2. This is all pre COVID. And so we were looking at the complement of all the DNA viruses, all the RNA viruses. So this is the type of data that we could perhaps generate. And especially on the RNA virus, I'd like to point out the most abundant in all the different samples. Again, sorry about the brutality, the lack of clarity. So the most abundant sequences corresponded to a, a plant virus, and this is all from human waste. But so the, one of the most abundant viruses that we secrete is actually a plant virus, not a human virus, a plant virus. But and coincidentally, that plant virus, the one that has been suggested as a good normalization factor for SARS-CoV-2 as well. But anyway, so this is the type of data that we could potentially get as well. And now, as I shared as well, it's not we, we don't need to stop with the identity. We can go in and figure out what those systems are actually capable of doing as well. And that I think could be used for that. And what else can we do when we think about the big ones, the big threats to human health? It's of course emerging pathogens, but also it's the functionality. What are organisms acquiring and sharing and exchanging? So one of the functionalities that comes to mind is antimicrobial resistance, mm -hmm. which is exploding resistance on the part of more and more organisms to more and more antimicrobial compounds. And this is, again, one of those invisible threats that we really need. We are very far behind on this. And non-targeted techniques can actually help us there as well. Thank you. One thing that's actually interesting about the, um, the CDC's wastewater surveillance program is that they started working on it a couple of years before the pandemic, looking at antimicrobial resistance. And then it was sort of pivoted to COVID um, in 2020. And now I think there is an interest in further expansion. Like, obviously, we can do more complicated sequencing, but there are really so many things that can be identified in wastewater. And I think the the research that's happened um, during COVID has been very helpful in just showing this potential and giving a lot of directions for future research and future public health efforts. Um, just to give a couple examples from things that I've reported on. So we can think about tracking, better tracking for the seasonal viruses that we deal with every year. Um, if you think about like flu and RSV, which the United States saw a lot of this past fall and winter, 
Um, also in New York City recently, we've had a lot of norovirus, which is kind of a nasty stomach bug. Uh, that's another thing that you can track in wastewater. Um, I did a story about this for Gothamist recently, and I talked to a researcher who um, is one of the leaders of the Wastewater Scan Project, which is an academic project out of Stanford and Emory Universities, um, where they have a network of hundreds of sites across the country where they're testing wastewater, and that feeds into the CDC's data, etc. And they're actually tracking, I think, seven or eight different viruses. So they have COVID, they have flu, RSV, uh, monkeypox, norovirus. And the, the researcher told me that, you know, for many of these other viruses, they had some clinical data, like from people going to the doctor to compare their wastewater results to. Um, but for norovirus, they actually didn't have any other uh, data to compare it to. And the wastewater results were showing patterns that we didn't really have a system for picking up before. Um, and their system actually picked up norovirus outbreaks a few weeks before news reports started emerging of like schools closing because of norovirus and all this stuff. So it really shows an opportunity to expand the networks that we've built up for COVID to look at all of these other things um, and kind of get a better sense of where people are getting sick and why they're getting sick and how do we respond to that in a way that is targeted and helpful um, and really responding to public health threats. Uh, another example that I think is really exciting is testing at airports and on airplanes. So think about, you can, you know, you can test from people's apartments or from residential areas, but you can also test the wastewater from plane bathrooms. And this is something that the CDC tested out with a company called Ginkgo last summer at JFK airport. So if anybody here happened to be flying internationally out of JFK in like August, you might, you might have been part of this pilot program, but um, yeah, so they are testing uh, wastewater from planes and they were actually able to identify, first of all, the majority of the planes tested positive for COVID. So <laughs> keep that in mind when you're flying. Uh, but they were able to identify variants like different versions of Omicron that were on these flights. Um, and the focus is on international flights because, for one thing, like practically people use the bathroom more on longer international flights. But also it's it's a really good way to keep an eye out for new COVID variants or other new pathogens that might be emerging in other parts of the world and that we might kind of pick up more quickly um, if we're testing this like broader sample as opposed to asking every single person who comes in through customs to like also do a PCR test. You can only imagine how annoying that would be, right? So that's another example. Um, but then I think the question really is, how do we take this data and translate it into public health action? Um, so I don't know if that's something that either of you would want to speak to more. I mean, I think that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. The, the challenge I think right now in New York is we're not there at all. Yeah. And we need to have the dashboards. We need to get rid of the clipboards. We need to have uh, you know, folks make this a priority. I uh, hope 633 three passes yes. because that would be an example where you are mandated to do those things. Sometimes in New York, that's the only way to get policy changed. So that's what I'm hoping. I think that um, uh, as time goes on, also with newer, um, uh, you know, uh, wastewater treatment plants themselves, that will also be helpful. So yeah. it is a big project. With 6233 specifically, what would that do for wastewater testing in New York? Well, it would mandate that we have to get the data, that it has to be uh, shared with the public on a regular basis, that there's a report to the city council mm -hmm. every year at the end of August, that there is uh, uh, the cost is important, even though you that doesn't help public health one way or the other, but it's good for public policy to know what the cost of this is and if it is uh, effective. In other words, right. if there, God help us, there's another disease that breaks out, is this program working? Did it tell us in advance or in real time what is happening? All of that. So if you don't, you know, you got to know it's working. Yes. So those are the, that's the kind of what the bill would do. Um, collect the data, test the data, figure out the cost of it, and is it effective? And then on a regular basis, do that and have a report and, you know, dashboard to go with it. I didn't know about the clipboards until today. Yeah, that's surprising. In terms of translating the data and using it for health, do you want to talk about how that's done at Columbia on campus? Because I think that's a really good example. Sure. Essentially, what we look for when we 
try to take action based on the data. We are looking for discrepancies between what the wastewater is telling us the, and, and, the, and the reported cases. Because, uh, again, in terms of coverage, the, the wastewater gives us more. So the university has been looking at the, uh, about 95 to 97% of the undergraduate uh, population uh, over the last about three years or so. And so uh, till last year, uh, depending based, based on the wastewater results, there would be alerts sent out to the residents of individual buildings. Uh, and in some cases, uh, there would be a, a requirement for those residents to test, to get tested as well. And as uh, over the course of the pandemic, as trends have shifted, that has uh, gone away. But uh, even today, uh, wastewater testing is the only uh, uh, testing that's actually done. And that has continued over the past uh, three years. Uh, there could be, uh, and of course, we need to decide what to do next. Uh, again, perhaps uh, take a step back and uh, let's say take a broader view, not, not just based on microbial indicators, but also potentially chemical indicators. Yeah, and I think that speaks to the value of having a wastewater testing infrastructure that includes not just the water treatment plants that are serving hundreds of thousands of people, but also getting more granular and saying, okay, are there specific sites in the sewer network where we can plug in and do neighborhood level testing? Going back to Boston as a comparator, this is something that Boston has actually started doing in the last few months. They selected, I think it's 14 neighborhood level sites where they're going in and they're testing from manhole covers and getting samples from a smaller and kind of more targeted number of people. And specifically, they, t they selected those sites with an eye towards health equity to think about, you know, where do we want to make sure that we know if there's a COVID spike and where do we want to make sure that we can be sending testing resources or booster vaccine resources other types of health resources that would help to respond. <clears throat> and then, then, of course, in the case of dorms, you know, you have a very tangible activity of saying, okay, all the students in this dorm need to go get a PCR test now, and we're going to quickly tamp down on an outbreak so that it doesn't spread to the whole building. Um, so those are just kind of think some helpful examples and thinking about like how to move this forward. Um, we have another 20-ish minutes, so I would love to open it up for anyone else in the audience who has questions yeah, about um, the manholes as people put their dog poop down it also i just want to add that. <laughs> that's true city. yeah you do have to select them carefully for logistical reasons <laughs> yeah um i'm just gonna you're right in front of me so go ahead uh a couple questions about implementation um and so one is just really basic can you guys explain to us you know i guess how they collect the sample and then and then maybe the way it gets analyzed and sort of like the, the mechanical aspect of it. Um, and then my second question, uh, Gil, what you said about uh, clipboards still, it's fascinating, you know. Um, I don't know if it's fascinating or insane. Yeah. Uh, I can see all most of the challenges in how you're going to convert that to digital. And, you know, this is probably beyond the scope of this, but how are they grappling with that? All I can tell you is I was told by somebody that today and on Monday morning, I will have an answer for you. <laughs> Do not have an answer for you right now. Okay. But I'm going to find out. That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. I put up this photo because this is from Professor Chandran's lab at Columbia where they do the analysis. Yeah, so on the implementation, I think it's uh, near consensus now that the composite sampling uh, that allows us to get the imprint over the course of a day uh, is much better than just taking a grab sample uh, where we could lose some resolution. And so indeed, these those bottles, the individual canisters are from each of the 21 buildings obtained over the course of 24 hours. And then right now in the day, there's three times a week. And so, yeah, so there are automated samplers, which are essentially just programmable pumps. And then there are some uh, peripherals like filters and everything else uh, that allow us to take samples like this. Uh, with manual covers, up, so Bergen County actually did also uh, all around the sewer shed, including pump stations, sandholes, different treatment plants, and so on. Uh, so getting into the data, there are also uh, uh, samplers that we can hang into the manholes. And uh, again, pumps, programmable, uh, we can program it and that. And then here at East, uh, with the university, since everything is done, uh, uh, same thing like a fairly controlled fashion in terms of the analysis, very much turn it around. We, we get all the samples around 10.30 in the morning from the 21 buildings. We are able to turn it around by 4 p.m., 5 p.m. the same day, so it's, it's fairly timely. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, so what we get from a wastewater treat plant uh, represents uh, more variability, uh, just, uh, just something called broad, 
But if we start to see changes in a building, then the nature of the action is quite different as well. Uh, very targeted, we know that there is something. Uh, so it's very important also from an implementation action perspective that we have a baseline uh, because everything is relative. Yeah, so it's important to be collecting data for a long time um, since one of the interesting aspects of this is that, you know, unlike the kind of traditional health data that you get from doctor's offices, um, this is data collected from the environment, so it can have environmental factors that influence the results. Um, for example, uh, there are some communities like in agricultural parts of California where there are a lot of farmlands and there could be like chemicals from pesticides to get into the wastewater. And so for researchers who are doing testing in those communities, they might need to have a kind of tweaks to their analytical process that, you know, account for that and that actually make sure the data is not just reflecting farm, farm practices. Um, airplane testing is another example of this because um, airplane bathroom wastewater is more concentrated, right? It's like just human waste. There's nothing else in there. Um, unlike residential waste where you also have cooking water and you have cleaning water and you have lots of other stuff going on. Um, so that's another example where the researchers who are working to test wastewater in that area might have to adapt their methodology in terms of how they're processing and analyzing samples to account for the specific environment that the samples are coming from. So there's a lot of scientific process that's still happening with this. It's super interesting. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I, thank you. This is really fascinating. I knew there was so much you know, amazing stuff in wastewater. You, you obviously have not for a long time. But I'm particularly interested in uh, bringing this information to the public on existing digital science, the screens that you see on the street and off the lines, on college campuses, uh, vast exposure potential for uh, public to get this added information. But you've talked about a lot of issues, both with the uh, you know the quality and the reliability of the data, um, and uh, availability of the data as well. So my question is, do you think exposing this information to the public in the public space like that is advisable? And second, if it is, what is the content that's actually available today that that is on a local ask basis? It could be distributed at scale. It were possible to you know, ingest that into a common platform and then deploy it and deliver it in displays uh, on a location, but you know, on, a, on a geo. But it, I realize it's sort of a big yeah, idea, but it touches on stuff that all of you, all, a lot of these people talking about. It. It's an interesting question. I mean, I know there are places where um, the wastewater testing program is working with like a health department to send out alerts like text alerts saying hey the sewer shed that you live in has been seeing an increase in covid we recommend that you think about getting a test or you go get your recent booster if you haven't that kind of thing um so that's something that i think could be adapted to new york city or other places um <clears throat> i think those alerts often tend to be like pretty basic rather than saying oh it was an increase of this number of like this COVID concentration, because those units can be sort of hard to wrap your head around. Um, so just saying like, hey, there's an increase, like be aware. Um, I think it's what's tended to work so far, but I don't know if either of you want to add oh, oh, there's no uh, better than I do about what is going on in other cities that is uh, more uh, localized in real time than New York. I think New York just needs to get caught up to Ben. Um, and, and at least we're, we're behind. We're really behind. And so the question is, what are we going to do with the lab, the staffing, the bill that hopefully passes, will it be implemented, et cetera? But I just want to get caught up and then hopefully, and I, I panic about the idea of another uh, COVID whatever coming to New York. You know, we had such a horrible experience. You know, for me, it's being ready for gun help, whatever is next. And I think that's what we're not ready for. I'll just very briefly add to this. So, uh, you know, uh, again, what comes out of rainfall to a wastewater treat plant? There are some challenges uh, really prescribing very specific actions, even to a community, because the variability that 
No, no, they have contains. Again, if you're talking about buildings, we know uh, we have. It's very specific. It's very specific. Yes, indeed. And so specific actions can be taken as well. In essence, we are talking about a microbial pollutant. Potentially, instead of an air pollutant, we're talking about a microbial pollutant. Uh, when uh, on days where air pollutant loads are higher, we get alerts. There's no prescriptive action, but we at least know the public knows what is happening. And so that's a suggestion, right? It yeah. cannot be perfect. It could be a possibility. Yeah. Digital transformation. Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, they talked about like, you know, what's in the fill and they'll ask that kind of thing. I'm curious through the year for each of you, like, what's your ideal for where this would be two years from now or something like that? I'm like, what's a locker? Like, I assume it's money, but like, is it literally just like having enough machines or like people that know how to see what's like, like, what's the deal on what, what are the obstacles for you? I don't think it's money at this moment. I think it's it's the political will. Um, you heard earlier that the challenge is uh, nervousness about giving data that panics people. I don't know how else to say it. So it has to be done. You know, uh, generally the air quality is a good example. But um, the lab is there. The staff is there. There's some really visionary people in this division that Pamela Largo hired. I think that she points out, um, and. Um, they need to just get to the point that we're uh, at least competitive uh, with some of the other cities that are doing this. It's not like we're the first, and there is precedent. So, again, I don't think it's money. I think it's a will to answer your question. Wrong. In terms of publishing the data and uh, making sure that it is um, effective and then it's off to clipboards and you know, across all 14 uh, plants, et cetera. Yeah, I think another part of that is um, like the way I think I said earlier that the way health data usually functions is very different from what we have with wastewater surveillance. Um, one thing that Dave Larson, the Syracuse professor who runs the statewide program, said to me that I thought was really helpful is that health officials, they often don't know what to do when there's not like a case they can contact trace. You know, if you think about the traditional public health data, it starts from a specific person who has a specific disease, you know, whether that's COVID or that's like a stomach bug or food poisoning or whatever, like there's a person and then your response can move out from that person. And wastewater surveillance is giving you data like in the opposite direction where you have this trend that reflects hundreds of thousands of people. And it's much less concrete in terms of where you go from that. You know, so if you have like the entirety of Staten Island has a signal for polio, you can't just go find a specific person. You have to, there are different types of actions that are taken from there. So I think on the public health side, from my reporting, I think there has been um, just challenges in helping health officials wrap their heads around this and what to do with it. Um, and I think in the next couple of years, we will hopefully see more scientific research um, from groups like Chandran's and, you know, more public health departments that are starting to do this and are starting to show how it works. Um, also, in terms of being behind, I think we haven't mentioned yet that uh, New York State's wastewater surveillance program recently announced a major expansion. Um, so they have gotten funding from the CDC and from Governor Kathy Hochul's office to both add about 100 more testing sites across the state and also start testing for several other endemic viruses. So I think that includes flu, the norovirus, maybe one or two other things. Um, you can Google this and find the press release with more details. But yeah, so even, you know, New York State is getting ready to expand and to you know, boost up its program and go beyond COVID in this way. And I think the local city council bill that we've been talking about might be helpful for New York City to kind of take similar steps. Um, what do you need to do more about health and the Yeah, those are both good questions. I mean, in terms of normalization, I think often you do adjustments based on population, but you want to talk more about that? Yeah, uh, they have different approaches proposed and, and they're being used as well. So one approach is to, to divide the SARS-CoV-2 concentrations by another 
marker virus that represents a, a population size, and that's where some of the, the BAMO viruses, PMMOE or cluster H, come into, come into, come into the discussion. Uh, that, that's been one approach. I don't think there's a final consensus there. There's also the possibility of uh, multiplying by the flow rate and looking at the total viral load, and that's been quite quite widely used. I think that's what Biobot does. Yeah, the, yeah. we actually uh, do the same thing, total viral load. It's, it's a good thing to track. With buildings, when we have the luxury of uh, being able to translate the wastewater concentrations into cases, we are able to do that. That is still, we are, we are far from getting out, doing that well, I would say, very, very frankly. Um, what was the second? Well, you mean prevention ethics, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there have been some papers showing like modeling of wastewater compared to clinical case data and using wastewater to try and predict cases or try and predict hospitalizations. This kind of gets harder because we don't have as much reliable case data as we used to. So you could do this more easily earlier in the pandemic where more people were getting PCR tested. And now our case numbers are just wildly underestimates of true infections. So that's gotten a bit harder. But I know it's something that researchers are working on. Um, in terms of the ethical considerations, this usually, as you said, it doesn't come up a lot with entire sewer sheds because there's just no way to trace it to an individual person. I think on the smaller level, it is something that researchers are thinking about. Um, and I think it's sort of a new area where you know, there's not a lot of real consensus yet, but yeah, it's something, it's something that like is on the mind for people. Heads to yes. What can we do as constituents or citizens to bring the awareness? We're talking about citizen advocacy because sometimes I think that city agencies work in cycle and isolation. Guys, I appreciate you all three being here, but this is not your norm. And this probably happens once a year in terms of hoping thing. So my thing is, what should we do from this point on? Because we don't want to come back next year with the same concern and it still has not yet been addressed. So what can we do to become more of advocates, right? Um, one of the attendees mentioned putting it on the sign. What is the terminology? I forgot you mentioned sign something. But bus stop. And everybody read them. So what else? Because again, not because it's DMV is anything do you could buy it all vote to support. Yeah, you have to find a way now yeah. to get us both of us here. Yeah, we have an interest in it, right? We are brought into this whole idea and your experience in Colombia. I'm just sitting here wondering what are the next steps? What can we do now? Because when we leave here today, we all are in different spaces. What should we do now to take it to the next level? There are only 11 people or 10 people on intro 633. So you can find out if your council member is on or not. And if not, 633. 633. That's the bill pending before the city council that would mandate some of the things that we're talking about today. Yeah. So that, to answer your question, that's what you should do. Also, just telling more people about this. Like, this is honestly such an impressive program. Um, I think the work from DEP that went into it is really astounding. And the fact that it was pulled together just a few months after the pandemic started is really incredible. And I think just letting people... Pam Arno. Yeah, Pam Arno, absolute hero. Um, yeah, so I think just telling people like, hey, this, this is available. Even if there isn't a New York City dashboard at this point, you can go look at it on the CDC site, on the New York State dashboard. And if you are trying to keep tabs on COVID in this city, it's really the best source to look at right now. Um, so that's what I would say. I think we have time for like one or two more questions, so. Thank you. Um, it's great that Columbia and the state and two city agencies and probably others are doing this work. Is it repetitive or duplicative to have everyone sampling there be a central source of data i imagine that exists in other public health scenarios yeah well the state program actually doesn't include new york city they are separate they are separate programs in that case and then new york city's data is like delivered to the cdc there is a bit of duplication there but it's kind of too complicated for me to get into right now we can talk about it more later if you want yeah 
Um, I mean, I do think the CDC overall has a big challenge of trying to compile and standardize um, because the way that wastewater surveillance started to happen early in the pandemic was really a grassroots effort from different research groups and some companies that got interested in it. And they all started doing like different methodologies and it were testing it out in different places. So now we have this national challenge of how do we standardize and make a data set that's really useful to compare across like New York City versus Seattle versus wherever else? Um, I think that's that's a challenge we're running into now. So either centralize it to that level or well, completely decentralize it, give the tools to individuals. Yes. Yeah. Or some combination. Or a combination. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and for people who want to read up on this more, there was a report that came out a few weeks ago by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, NASEM, um, that is all about wastewater surveillance, uh, what the CDC could be doing, how to better standardize all of this stuff. So good resource. Real quick one, from COVID Act Now, which is a project of uh, the Medical Schools of Georgia Stanford, Harvard, has done a great job of aggregating uh, COVID statistics, COVID uh, data, up at county level and the HMSA level. And they have an API that is very good, very reliable. I wonder if you're familiar with them, whether that's a model for this kind of roll up that you're describing. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that is a great group. Um, I think it's challenging because of the standardization issues of different groups doing different things in their methodologies. So the CDC has a national data set that's kind of the best available right now, um, but we're working on it. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for coming. I hope this was interesting. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.